Good morning from Imperial College London, Hammersmith Hospital. Today on February the 4th, 2014, we are presenting a live transmission from the Cath Lab A with Dr. Eva Amalek and Dr. Chris Boyd. The patient in question is a 66-year-old female who has a history of hypercholesterolemia which is treated with statins, hypotension, a family history of coronary artery disease and type 2 diabetes for which she takes oral medication. She was previously a smoker, having stopped over 10 years ago. Her cardiac history includes a myocardial infarction in 2001, which was treated with a bare metal stent to the LAD. More recently, since uh, December, she's had Levantine positive angina, which has been reproducible. She attended for the coronary cath lab in January 2014, where she was found to have severe lesions in the RCA and the circumflex, which were treated with angioplasty and drug eluting stents. There is a moderate lesion left in the LAD, which is likely to represent instant restenosis, and that's for assessment today. Here are some images of the right coronary artery that was uh, stented successfully. And this is of the circumflex. The vessel in question today is the LAD, and there is a long segment of disease after the diagonal branch, including likely instant restenosis of the previous stent. We're now going to go to the cath lab in order to see Dr. Malik and the deaths of the team. screen the leg. Dr. Malik? Right, well welcome to uh, Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust and uh, very grateful for uh, the patient for allowing us to um, to study her uh, with the live case. Uh, introduce the team, it's uh, myself, Iqbal Malik, uh, uh, Chris Broy, the registrar, uh, Chandra, uh, Carol and Mario as the, uh, the cath lab team. Um, so we're just, uh, we've placed some sheaths into the groin um, and previously we'd done a, a radial uh, procedure uh, specifically because uh, we want to, in, if we need to in the grey zone, uh, compare IFR and FFR. Uh, we've gone femorally so we can place a venous sheath. Uh, I don't know whether you can see the angiogram but uh, there's some tortuosity in the leg. I've got to admit I'm a radialist. Uh, and so uh, really it's only for the, the purposes of this meeting and education that uh, we've decided to place a femoral sheath to also allow us easy access to uh, the femoral vein so we can give adenosine if required. Uh, obviously as, uh, as we move towards uh, validating IFR it may be that the adenosine is not as required and we may avoid uh, um, large venous punctures. Um, so uh, there is the concept of uh, whether uh, placing a large venous line in the leg is essential, or whether a large ball cannula in the antecubital fossa would be fine, versus, of course, intracoronary adenosine being given uh, to give the same effect. Uh, so I'm just going to take a picture uh, of the right coronary artery. Um, she had stents both in the circumflex and the right, and obviously, uh, as she's come back for a procedure, we'd like to check the handiwork. A little test there, please. Okay, so there we are. Okay, so uh, we'll give some nitrates. Uh, um, I'm a great believer in taking pictures with nitrates. It's got adequate blood pressure room. So why waste a picture without nitrates when you can take one with nitrates? So I've given 200 mics of nitrates. Um, there could be a discussion in the room about what uh, what the right dose is, but a couple of hundred mics seems, uh, seems right to me. And since I'm doing the case, that's what we're going to use. So let's take a picture. And I don't know whether that comes up on screen. Obviously, it's fairly atheromatous vessel cranial view, please. Uh, several bites taken out of it. Uh, the stent is in the mid, mid to distal segment, just beyond the RV branch. And it looks widely patent. Uh, one can appreciate there, we'll let the angiogram play, just over the overlap of the catheter. Uh, in the PLV branch, there are a couple of further pinches. That's quite a long way down. And the key thing to remember is that um, her anginal symptoms have got uh, quite dramatically better 
and there's a feeling of ectopic beats which is troubling her most. So I'd say that that right coronary artery uh, didn't look as though it needed immediate attention and the aim was to check the proximal LAD and we're going to change over on a wire because that uh, you may have appreciated that the iliofemoral system was a little tortuous. We're already set up uh, to avoid delaying the audience um, with the venous sheath in situ and also an adenosine infusion uh, which is ready to go. Um, we may or may not need to use that. If we're in the grey zone, we'll demonstrate what the uh, differences might be. But if it's a very clear answer with IFR, uh, then we'll just use the IFR reading. D Dr. Malik, may I ask a question? Yes. How often do you perform coronary physiology in the catheter labs here at Hammersmith Hospital? Uh, it's, it's increasingly common. So uh, we probably do about uh, 13 to 1,500 angioplasties a year. And uh, it's now become almost routine that if we have a borderline lesion, lead with the wire, please. If we have a borderline lesion, we'll perform the physiology at the time. Uh, in my mind, it's certainly an extension of the diagnostic process. Of course, it raises the concept of who should be doing the diagnostic angiography, which is quite a big question. Uh, again, I think if... Uh, uh, as physiology becomes uh, a much more of a routine uh, situation, then the ability to pass a, a wire into the coronary lesion uh, should be part of the armamentarium of anyone who's doing a diagnostic angiogram. And that may mean that the only people who are doing diagnostic angiograms are people who could also do an angioplasty, but that's uh, quite a big culture change in the UK at least. So, so a lot is, uh, is what I'm saying. Uh, okay, that's good. So we're into the left main stem. And perhaps the first point to bring out, in other words, you can see the pressure tracing. Um, I like my dichrotic notches. Uh, it would suggest that the trace is not pressure damped. And of course, if you have pressure damping in the left main stem, uh, then you're immediately in a situation where the uh, physiological assessment becomes more challenging. So uh, we're gratified to see that this is not pressure damping in the left main stem. Uh, pressure is still adequate, therefore I've given her another 200 micrograms of nitrate. Now I've noticed through my peripheral vision that Carol's at the top end, you can see her on screen. We don't want to irradiate Carol unnecessarily, so I've deliberately waited uh, so that we don't give her that radiation dose. Uh, so I think the, that RAO view is not really going to help. So can we go RAO caudal? We know the anatomy from before, we know we put a circumflex dent in. So we'll take some caudal shots to check the circumflex dent and then the cranial shots to set up uh, our LAD picture. Okay, so the circumflex look good, but on that view, I think you can appreciate that there is uh, a moderate lesion in the left anti-ascending artery just on the horizon there. So we'll need to map that out a bit further. Do a, do a PA caudal as well. And actually, comparing this to the uh, previous angiogram, um, that LAD lesion has either progressed or the fact that I've given quite a lot of nitrates uh, has uh, made it look as though it's a more significant lesion because it's dilated all the normal segments. Um, let's take the spider and then we'll do the cranial views. So I suspect the audience can appreciate actually a very attractive result from the circumflex. We couldn't uh, really say that there was any problem with the circumflex. Now that was a very tight stenosis before. Okay, so let's take that picture. Okay, fantastic. So we can see that uh, whatever's in the LAD is clear of the ostium. The circumflex are great. And now we just need to get some sizing shots of uh, uh, where we're going to place our wire. Okay, let's do that cranial. Okay, so that's a good shot. So we'll map that shot. And we'll map the, uh, the, the REO caudal shot. And it will give us two views of, uh, of how we're going to set up uh, for our pressure wire to allow a safe passage of the wire distally. So we'll clear the, uh, the decks uh, and uh, perhaps we can show live as we open uh, the, uh, the, the new Volcano uh, Veruta wire. So um, can we have the packet please? So if we just demonstrate the packet maybe, um, we're going to focus on the bottom end of the table. Um, so let's uh, pan our camera down to the bottom end of the table. Okay, fantastic. And so we'll open up the, uh, the wire. So we've got the Volcano console set up. Dr. Bradley, you, you mentioned that this is a new Verata wire. Can you please tell us what the difference is between this new system 
and the more traditional pressure wire system? Yeah, okay, so of course there are two large players in the market, um, and so St. Jude and Volcano have uh, products which will uh, perform uh, FFR analysis. Obviously, IFR done in the style that's uh, uh, got the most evidence is only available on the Volcano system currently. Uh, the previous pressure wires, I think we'll have to accept, were not angioplasty wires. Uh, they had a physiological purpose, they were slightly stiff, and certainly you needed a little bit more skill getting those wires down uh, than uh, an ordinary angioplasty wire. Now with the, with the new system here, there are two differences. First, the quality of the wire itself. I'd say it's very much closer to what an angioplasty wire would do in terms of the way that it behaves going down the coronary artery. And the second is certainly the connector system. And so if I point at the connector system here, it's an easy in-out, which we'll demonstrate in a second. Um, and that and the join between the connector system and the wire, I think, are, are very major improvements. In the old system, uh, uh, certainly with the Volcano system, there was an issue with a fragility at the join between the pressure connector at the bottom end and the rest of the wire. Uh, of course, you could use uh, uh, the St. Jude uh, Bluetooth system. Uh, that's quite a heavy blob on the end, and I must say I haven't found that a, a major advantage myself. And, of course, with the St. Jude system, you don't have IFR available, at least not IFR with the A logarithms that Justin Davies has developed. So um, I think Mike, those are the two major advantages. Dr. Mike, showing us how the, um, the pressure wire is set up, please? Okay, so uh, we've got, uh, so what we'll do first is just to flush the system. I think, uh, so there's an easy port available uh, to allow a saline injection. And I think you probably won't be able to appreciate on camera, but we saw fluid going through the tubing, so we know that we've got adequate amount of fluid in. Just to be sure, we'll put another five mils in, so we've got a good 10 mils. It's now coming out over here, so there can be no doubt that there is fluid in the system. So we'll then open up the first packet and here's a connector and we'll hand over to uh, Mario our physiologist and Mario will just plug it into the machine that we've already got powered up. The machine, I don't know whether you can see the tracing on the machine, uh, but the machine already has the uh, aortic pressure tracing uh, visible on it. So uh, I suspect there isn't, is there a camera? There we are, fantastic. So there's uh, aortic pressure tracing on and uh, what we'll do is uh, we're waiting for the zero. You can see at the bottom corner of the machine, waiting for zero. And that waiting for zero is a very important step. We're not touching it. Uh, I'm asking Chris not to get too keen with that wire. Uh, it now says it's zeroed and it's ready to insert. So um, it, it is possible just to uh, insert the wire as it is attached fully. But actually, one of the advantages of the system is that if we uh, remove this connector, okay, and then we can draw the wire out, now this connector, if we can focus on it, I'll, I'll show it like this. If I slide my thumb backwards, the wire releases. And if I want to reconnect it, as long as I've kept it dry, it's really a very simple process to lay it in and catch. So uh, very easy both ways. So um, what I'm going to do is use it like an ordinary angioplasty wire. We're going to take the introducer off. We'll place that on again afterwards and we'll use it like the angioplasty wire. So we'll draw it all the way out. I'll hand the connector end to Chris. And so perhaps if we focus on the tip of this wire, I'll hold it up against a, a piece of white. Okay, so you can maybe focus on that wire and come, come in on it. Okay, so very flexible, uh, very akin to an angioplasty wire, no bend on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it through the needle introducer. And I'm going to place a small bend at the end. So much as you would with any angioplasty wire. And so I think if I put it against the white, maybe you can see that there's a sort of 45 degree bend on the wire, just as you would with an angioplasty wire. Now, uh, I'm just going to uh, remind myself that I've, I've, got, I've already given the heparin. Uh, so, uh, so we've given heparin already. We've given her 5,000 units of heparin in case we need to progress further. We can check an ACT a little bit later, but 3 to 5K is more than adequate uh, for just the quickness of a pressure wire assessment. And, so and you mentioned you gave nitrates. How important are nitrates to performing a pressure wire study? 
Uh, so within the uh, previous few minutes. So I gave the nitrates initially just to be sure that my angiographic shots were perfect. Before we do the final pressure wire assessment, we'll give some more nitrates as adequate pressure. I think the nitrate effect may well have worn off within five minutes, and so I'd certainly be topping up the nitrates before we make the IFR measurement. So we'll pass the, the wire down. As I say, I mean, I think uh, if there are some demo uh, products available, it'd be great for people to feel this wire. Uh, it really does feel like an angioplasty wire. Can we go to the caudal view, please? Just PA caudal. Yeah, just PA caudal, if you could fling the camera over. OK. Bring it up a bit. Thank you. Talker on, please. So can you come up a little bit further? It's the LED that we're interested in. So just uh, move the move the table slightly. Unlock the table for me. Thank you. Okie kokie. Lovely. And so again, some people like the talker, some people don't. Uh, I must say I, I like the talker. Would you mind placing the correct road map up on there? Thank you. No. That's fine. I think that's close enough. That's the caudal shot. That's what I needed. Okay, little test there. Okay, so that's not into the correct vessel. So all we're going to do is try and get it into the LAD. And uh, we will just straighten our catheter slightly to give ourselves a head start. Okay, so I'm pretty confident that's in the LAD. Um, what I'm going to do is two things. Take the uh, y y the uh, two balls back, take the needle introducer back, less likely that the uh, wire will start moving around. And just to f document for sure that we're in the LAD uh, for the purpose of this meeting, we will take a little angio run. Okay, fluoro acquire, please. So we can reduce the radiation dose by doing a fluoro acquire shot. And that's, uh, I think we can be convinced that's definitely in the left main stem. Uh, would you be happy with that, Sook? Absolutely. Okay, so, so is this if the we point focus on the bottom end here, the key is to maintain dryness. So I've dried my hands. I've deliberately not touched the distal end of the wire. Okay, uh, I'll give that a wipe. Okay, now if we're focusing on the bottom end of the table, again, we can see that there is a series of connectors, and I think that's the advantage of this wire, the series of connectors. We place the wire in. Let me hold it slightly closer. So we place the wire in. There's a little knob at the end. Maybe you can sort of see that it's catching. Maybe you can appreciate there's a catch. So that tells us the wire's in the right place. We then lay it down and slide on. And I'm expecting to see a signal. And that looks a beautiful signal. Okay, so if we look at the, the pressure tracing, uh, again, we've double-checked that there is uh, no pressure damping. The uh, aortic tracing has that dichrotic notch. Uh, the yellow tracing, which is from the pressure wire, is exactly overlaid on top. And actually, the PDPA is 1.0. Uh, what I'm going to do is just give nitrates. So if we take the nitrates, the needle introducer is out, and therefore it's not going to all spill out onto the table. So we'll give another 200 mics of nitrates. Can we flush that through, please? Okay, and then we're going to give 20 seconds for nitrates, uh, the flush effect, just to uh, wear off. Even if you give a bolus of saline, uh, often you can get a little bit of uh, flow-related hyperemia. So we're just going to let it all settle down. And once uh, it's settled, 10, 15 seconds, nitrate effect is on board, the flush effect has disappeared, uh, then we will uh, normalize. And if we look at the screen, there is a normalize button. Uh, one of Mario's most important roles is to press that button. Thank you, Mario. So let's press that button. Okay, that's good. Occasionally, there's a real shatter on the signal. Uh, especially the yellow signal, and if we do see that, it's normally because there's such high flow in the arteries that uh, the wire is really moving around a lot, and a small adjustment of the wire position usually settles that down. But we've got good tracings. We're convinced that the uh, PDPA is one, and so we can go distal to the lesion. Now, if you go crazy, please, uh, Richard, uh, then we've got a roadmap shot showing that we can get beyond that moderate lesion in the proximal LAD, and so that's where we're going to go next.
Dr. Malik, can I ask a question? You made a point of performing normalization there. At the very beginning of this case, the wire was already at a ratio of one. How important is the normalization process? Okay, well, I think it should be part of your routine uh, because, number one, it's making sure there's absolutely no drift, and number two, uh, the machine is also confirming uh, that the tracings are completely overlaid. To your eye, it may look completely overlaid, but I think uh, you should make it part of your routine to press that normalize button, even if the PDPA is 1.0, so that no one can question what the result was afterwards, because you may not save all of the tracings, but if you've gone through that step, then whatever reading you get thereafter is at least validated according to a protocol. If you miss out a step or two of any protocol, uh, you begin not to believe the results at the end. So I'd say, it's even if it was 1.0, press the button. It doesn't Thanks. take very long, and, and otherwise, you know, Mario might be getting a bit bored at the bottom of the table. He wouldn't have that job to do, so... So Thank we'll put the much. needle introducer back in again just to advance our wire down. And we've got the correct roadmap up on screen, so we don't really need to give contrast uh, because we know we're going down the LAD. And so we should be well beyond the lesion. So well beyond that proximal lesion. Now let's take a little fluoro choir shot. Again, we don't need to waste radiation, but we want to know that the wire is down distally. Yep. Okay, so I think we can be convinced that we're beyond the first diagonal branch, and the point of interest uh, really was uh, in that very proximal part of the LAD. So I'm going to withdraw the needle introducer. And I think it's quite useful, especially if one's inexperienced with the wire, just to double check that that wire hasn't moved at all. And I think that looks exactly the same position beyond the diagonal. So I'm not going to waste more dye uh, in doing that. Now, let's have a look at the uh, pressure tracing again. And what we can see is that there certainly has been a small amount of change. Now, you could say, hang on, maybe that's drift. Well, we can check that at the end because we'll pull back and may take another pressure reading in the left main stem. But it may well be that there's a genuine situation. So, um, so we don't know how to interpret the PDPA. Of course, if the PDPA was 0 0.5, I think we'd all be clear that something very significant must have happened. Um, and we need to be double sure that there, there's no drift. Uh, but actually, at 0 0.94 for the PDPA, I wouldn't be able to say for sure what the answer was. And so now's the time that I think we should take an IFR reading. And I think the key to it is we've got the machine set up for IFR. And look at the speed of it. So away we go, Mary. So the patient's not doing anything. Uh, they're not feeling anything. We're taking an average of about five beats. And we've got a number which is 0 0.93. So I always like to do uh, two or three readings. So let's do it again. Okay, 0 0.93, so it's showing the consistency of IFR. And, and Dr. Malik, how do you interpret these values? Okay, so I think uh, it's, a, it's a moving field, uh, and I think uh, we're learning more and more. So just like with FFR, cutoff was initially 0 0.75, now it's sort of hovering at 0 0.8. I think most clinicians, if you had the right clinical context with severe angina and uh, and something that said 0 0.81 with a fairly significant looking lesion would probably treat it. Whereas in that same 0 0.81, if there was no angina and had a moderate lesion, you probably wouldn't. So I think there's no absolute cutoff, but the numbers of 0 0.93 consistently on three shots is right at the point where you'd say, look, that probably is negative. And I'd say for her, if we were just doing a clinical study, she hasn't got any angina left. We're not looking to put a stent in unnecessarily. And so this, I would say, was probably a negative test. It was 0 0.97, that would be even better. But at 0 0.93, Do I'd say that was a negative test. So m more recently, we've been using the, the hybrid approach of comparing using IFR and FFR together. Yep. And I'm just showing a slide here that shows that values of over 0.93, we're very confident that the FFR is unlikely to be below 0 0.80, uh, whereas IFR values below 0.86 are almost certainly likely to have an FFR of below 0 0.80. So in those cases, we can uh, spare patients of having any adenosine at all. And in the in-between zone, then we, uh, we may give adenosine, so in order to be able to use FFR to help guide our strategy. Can you comment on that, Dr. Malik? Yeah, so I mean, I think it, uh, I'm aware of that data, obviously, because we, we generated it here partly. So, um, so because it's at that 0 0.93 level, and, and because this is obviously a training course, and we're set up to give adenosine, and I'm going to be tempted to give the adenosine, one, to see the effect of it, 
uh, and what the FFR reading will be. We'll switch over on the console to FFR, but also to see what the effect on the patient is going to be. She is uh, beautifully asleep. I gave her 2.5 of morphine, one of midazolam, and she is extremely comfortable. Um, and we can just see whether she notices whether we're doing anything different. So we've got a venous sheath in, and we've got adenosine set up. So I'd like to just push forward a little bit just to clear the line. Go forwards, please. So uh, I don't know whether you can hear the beeping noise from the machine. So we've taken all precautions to make sure that we don't have any delay. So the infusion is set up. It's been run through the pump. Uh, there we go. Okay, so just making sure the last bit of bubble is gone. Okay, so we're set. And so we're giving 140 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And we're going to start recording the FFR. And I tend to wait a minute. We're looking at the ECG. Occasionally we get heart block. Uh, we're looking at the pressure. Occasionally there's a nose dive in pressure. But we're going to run the infusion for a minute. And I've chosen not to inform the lady directly and wake her up to tell her because she's nicely asleep. But we'll see if in about 15, 20 seconds she decides to wake up and tell us that something's happening to her. Oh, you are awake. Okay. Can you feel anything at all? No, no. Good. That's very good news. Oh, hold up and still. Hold up and still. No, 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 no. Put your hand down again. Okay. No. Okay. We've got a professional nose scratcher available. So, Richard, would you mind scratching her nose? She's on the adenosine infusion, Richard. Okay. There's no x-rays at the moment. A tightness in your chest. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay, so you're feeling quite uncomfortable there. So we're uh, coming up to a minute. We're almost finished here. So we're coming up to a minute. And the FFR reading, if we take it there, it's, uh, it's at 0 0.84, which I think uh, uh, most uh, physiology experts would say is negative. So we've had a minute. I don't want to go any further with her being uncomfortable. Stop the infusion, please. Okay, and we'll take the, uh, take the run. Okay, so we've got an FFR of 0 0.84, which I think we'd consider negative. Uh, we can go live again, because what we want to do is to be sure that once everything has cleared out, we've had no drift. And so the FFR is 0 0.84, I'd say negative. The IFR is 0 0.93, I'd say that was negative as well. Um, it didn't take long for us to do the FFR measurement. That's because we were set up already with a venous sheath in, uh, with the identity infusion set up. But what we did notice was that uh, she did get a little uncomfortable. I think she classed the pain as severe. So let me just ask, out of 10, from 0 to 10, how uncomfortable was that for you? 9. Okay, so, so 9 out of 10. So... So uh, I didn't. I, that's right. I, I think I, I was clear. I uh, I wasn't going anywhere with that. So so I think uh, we can now see that it's pretty much gone back to the number of PDP of 0.94, which is where it was before we started. So I'm certainly not planning on treating this lesion. If I were. I would just do it on this wire. I'd probably push the wire down a little bit further, but I would do it on the wire. And I've done that before. It seems to work perfectly well, and we can get a post reading as well uh, out of the same wire with no difficulty. Again, uh, there's no absolute reason to try and re uh, normalize, uh, but sometimes I have done if it's been easy to cross the lesion just to be absolutely certain that we've got a beautifully functioning wire, but it's not essential. So what I'm going to do now is to drift this wire back into the left main stem and show you the screen to make sure that the PDPA is very close to one and there's been no drift. Okay, so we'll just bring that uh, all the way back. Okay, so that's just outside the catheter. Fluoro acquire that picture, please. Okay, and so let's have a look at that. What's the position of the O-ring, sir? So go back to the PA caudal so we can just uh, get the position exact. Okay, so the position is pretty much the same as it was. Now we've had a slight drift there. No, the introducer's out. Okay, so we're definitely set up exactly the same way. There's been a very slight drift. Okay, now what I might do is just to be absolutely sure, and I think uh, it's easy enough to do, is to renormalize. Okay, so can we renormalize? And I think with physiological measurements, uh, it's easy enough when the kit is straightforward to just remeasure. And I think we should be absolutely certain, shouldn't we? So if we go back to the cranial view, then it's going to be very easy to pass the wire down again, and we'll do another IFR measurement, see if there's been any change, okay? Because that may have been a significant drift. I suspect it probably wasn't a significant drift, but let's be absolutely certain. So we'll 
pass the wire down again and basically we're at the same point as we were before fluoro acquire that that's fine okay and so we're on IFR and the PDPA down there hasn't really changed from where it was in the left mainstem when we started. Uh, initially, we renormalized. It got to 1.0. It's now gone back to 0 0.96, 0 0.97 that we were getting before we made our IFR measurement. That's when I was saying I couldn't tell whether it was going to be positive or negative. Let's record the IFR measurement again. I suspect the number is going to be 0 0.94 or something. 0.95. We'll do three measurements. So 0 0.93 is negative, 0 0.95 is also negative. I don't think we have a significant change in the clinical situation. But actually what I am going to do is, just for the demonstration purposes, switch the adenosine back on again in a minute and uh, apologize to the patient that we're going to do that test one more time. It's like an exercise test, so she's okay with it. So, uh, so 0 0.95, 0 0.96 is what we're reading. Um, still negative. Okay, fine. So we're going to switch to FFR. Let's switch the infusion on. So if you bear with us for one more minute, we'll get one further reading. The introducer is out. The pressure tracing shows no damping. Has it started? Are we, have we started? It started? I can't hear it. I can't hear it. So one of the disadvantages of using adenosine is that you have to have a pump. And uh, almost in any lab I've worked, the pump beeps in the same way. It started now. OK, fantastic. So we've got a minute to run. And we'll get another reading. Uh, I, you know, if I, I'm not a betting man. But if I was to bet, I'd say the number was pretty close to 0 0.84 or 0 0.85 again this time. Uh, I don't think we're going to find a physiological effect that's significant here. Eve, OK, here it goes again. Nice and still for me. You're doing very, very well. Just bear with us. You're doing very, very well indeed. OK, we've had one atrial ectopic there, but no bradycardia. The aortic pressure tracing looks good. Oh, no, she's not enjoying it. OK, so we've got five more seconds to go, and then we're going to stop the infusion. So we've got to 0 0.86. I was miles out. I said 0 0.85, didn't I, Chris? Uh, it's just Luckily, I'm not a betting man. OK, so uh, let's stop there. We That's can stop the infusion. That That's stuff great. will be wearing off for you. OK, and so what we're going to do is we're going to let the infusion wear off, get back to our baseline, and just uh, recheck for any drift in the left main stem, and I think that will be the end of the case. So we'll just give it uh, 15, 20 seconds to wear off. Obviously, adenosine wears off very quickly. So the key steps there while we wait for this to wear off are the, the wire having a very easy on-off connector, uh, being very malleable, very much like an angioplasty wire, um, and also then the technique of pressure wire, which is to make sure your guide catheter is coaxial, not causing pressure damping. Uh, you uh, make sure you normalize uh, in the le uh, just uh, in the left main stem, uh, and then uh, pass your wire beyond the lesion, record your position, make sure you're given nitrates, and then take the readings. And I think uh, the concept of the gray zone is always going to be there. This is a biological system. And so if you're very close to one, you know you're absolute certain. If you're 0.5, you know you're absolutely certain. In the gray zone, I think the, the data that Justin Davies has produced uh, with uh, the hybrid technique, I think, is very reasonable while we learn more about things, and oh, uh, it clarifies oh, the gray zone. It would be wonderful just to uh, see if there's a normalization issue. I couldn't quite hear you there. So let's, uh, let's pull the wire back to the left main stem. Okay, so that is in the left main stem again. Okay. And so we can see 0 0.99. I think you can see the screen. Um, so, you know, I think there was a little drift maybe on the first system. In fact, what that drift has done, now that we've corrected for it, is made it even more profoundly negative both on IFR and FFR. So we can be even more confident that we shouldn't be doing anything to what angiographically, I think, 
number of my colleagues would have just put a stent in straight away and said, look, that looks significant. It's a proximal LAD. Even though, you know, I think those who are more evidence-based would say that putting a stent in the proximal LAD hasn't got a prognostic advantage, especially not in a stable patient, and that treating a moderate lesion without physiological assessment would also not have any evidence base behind it. But, you know, we are in a real-world situation. So hopefully we've been able to demonstrate the ease with which we can do a pressure wire assessment, um, both with and without adenosine. The adenosine obviously making uh, her slightly more uncomfortable. Um, and uh, as I said at the start, okay. the, re the reason we've done it this way is to demonstrate the, both the IFR and the FFR, otherwise we would have gone radially and probably not, uh, uh, not taken the advantage of having a venous sheath in the leg. That's great. Thank you very much, Dr. Malek and Dr. Boyd, and of course to the cath lab team and to the patient. Thank you very much. All the much. very best.